Four, Arena's abridged version of their 1995 biographical trilogy of Peter Sellers, but using only film he shot himself, a different sort of biography as he filmed it. Peter Sellers was known to the world through his dazzling characterizations in over 60 films. His comic genius and his turbulent relationships made him one of the most talked about men in the world, and yet he remains an enigma. He often claimed to have no identity outside the roles that he played. But he's left his own portrait of another Peter Sellers, the one that he filmed himself. Answerable to no one's whims but his own, and with a little help from his friends, he obsessively filmed his homes, his family, people he knew, anything that took his fancy, right to the end of his life. Sometimes he'd leave the reels uncut. Sometimes he'd carefully edit them into polished little stories and scenarios. They were known to no one but his immediate circle. This treasure trove of intimate film remained undiscovered until long after his death in 1980. It's an archive so surprisingly extensive that Arena now tells the Peter Sellers story using only the film that he shot himself. It's a journey through his world as he filmed it. met him he was doing Razor Laugh and then of course the Goon Show. I would think I probably laughed more with him than anybody I've known in my life. Probably cried more too. said what he saw himself as it was a big fat jolly boy and he was really very fat uh, while well, he's about 14 and a half stone I think then um, he had sort of long wavy hair uh, he used to wear these huge suits with great wide shoulders I think he looked a bit like um, a spiv really you know I should live with him in his house. And I notice a rather, I don't know, unpleasant relationship between him and his mother. I used to sleep on a Milo by his bed. I spent half the bloody night blowing it up, and it spent the rest of the night going down when I slept on it. So I'd end up on floorboards. And he'd say in the morning, Peg, 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 she said, what is it, dear? Can I have some breakfast, Peg? And I realized that he was doomed for a heart attack through sheer lack of activity. 
He'd always sit and never stand. He bought shoes with elastic sides so he wouldn't have to bend down to tie up the laces. He was really instrumental in getting me into the BBC. He was very kind like that. Now then, um, what were you stoning? Oh, a bottle. <laughs> it's my new correspondence course in muscle type development. <laughs> Pull tug, wrench lift, wiki wiki wiki. <laughs> Makes funny face, wait for applause, not a stuffy. Pull tug lift. <laughs> Ooh. I don't think I was uh, particularly bowled over by him at that time. But I went to see him on stage and I think that's really when I started to be interested because on stage he was absolutely extraordinary, wonderful. Well, I used to do, as they say, stars of, sta stars of stage screen and radio. <laughs> I used to do, I used to do Peter Lorre from the Morty's Fork, and you remember? <laughs> and I used to do Humphrey Bogart and Peter Lorre and Sidney Greenstreet. My God, sir, you are a card. You really are a card. <laughs> Stop twisting my arm, you're hurting my arm. You're hurting me. So a selection of those. <laughs> I said, Tommy Hanley, well, isn't that nice? What is it? <laughs> it's me largest leavings. <laughs> well, I'll go to the foot of our set. TTFN, what does that mean? He said, Tata for now. No, she said, YTYTK, what's that? She said, you're too young to know. And then I got into a show, eventually, with Ted Ray. It was one of the best things I could have ever done. Don't give in, try and win. Don't be like a passport for the crowd. That man taught me more about uh, timing and the business than anything or anyone so far. And raise a laugh! I used to uh, suggest characters, and Ted would suggest uh, characters for me to play, and we'd uh, improvise around them. Ah. Come, come now, my boy, that's nothing to cry about. It's not that, Totty. I'm crying because my holidays are over. Holidays, eh? Where did you go? Paris, the city of love. <laughs> Crystal Jollybottom. Now, she was an old sort of child lady in the tradition of Mrs. Mop. And she used to say, her catchphrase was, Oh, you sauce box. Oh, dear, what have you been up to, Mr. Ray? You know, oh, I don't know. Just a talk like that. And we had a character called Serge Suit, who was a sort of Russian character who spoke a uh, with a, say, an accent, something like um, the Pirouiches on the waterwall of Morozerwarsky's uh, Zerwarski's which is at the narrow exhibition, uh, are very, very good. Or that is sparrow, actually, if you are looking at the Pirouich as listening to the music at the Sarawai and Tarawai. Dad was uh, convinced always I was going to be a road sweeper, you see. He always <laughs> told me, very encouraging with Dad, you see. Yeah. So you turn out the bloody road sweeper, will you? I'll tell you that. Um, when, when I first went up to Bingley in Yorkshire, where Dad's people came from, Dad used to be the organist at Bradford Cathedral, you see. A young lad, you see. And to be in that in the stage business, you know, was all sort of sinful in a way, because they were farmers and whatnot, you know. When he was teaching me to play the uh, banjo, legend had it that he taught George Formby. I don't know whether he ever did, actually, but he used to boast about it. Anyway, he probably did, actually, because he was quite good on guitar and whatnot. I've got a clock that wakes me every morning for my... No. <laughs> Jim and oh golly gosh, oh gee, I'm falling in love and so is she. I haven't told her, she hasn't told me, but we know it just the same. 
Saturday night on her city. Oh, what a time there's going to be. I haven't told her. She hasn't told me, but we know it just the same. We don't do much spooning, but we will. You wait until we're honeymooning. Saturday night on her city. Oh, what a time there's going to be. I haven't told her. She hasn't told me, but we know it just the same. You got your sock full of spaghetti ready, Echo? Yeah, I'm keeping mine warm. Ha! I got it on. <laughs> Undercrank, we like undercrank film, all this, I couldn't move very fast. I had an 8mm camera and uh, he had a 16mm camera because he was richer than me. <laughs> he was richer by 8mm. <laughs> He wasn't very happy with me um, acting. I think he was such a possessive person that, uh, in fact, he preferred me to be around the whole time, so he never really liked me acting. He never really liked me going away anywhere. In fact, he was always throwing tantrums or scenes or uh, saying he won't let me out of the flat or um, he'd taken a hundred aspirins just as I was going on stage but I guess one got used to that in time too and you'd think oh well it was just Peter and throwing a tantrum you know. It was like a spoiled child really at its worst when he was like that. Of course Peter then was only a goon star he was not a film star. He struck me as a very charming, chirpy little spiv with a big car, big red Bentley outside the studio, prominently parked every morning. And I had a feeling that he was rather impressed uh, working with a lot of established, so-called established actors like Alec Guinness. Let's get this clear. No one is running out now. That goosehead is reliable and dangerous. I had to, to sweeten him. That leaves the three of us. All right. He uh, gave me and the others a special farewell present which he had recorded on a tape. He was an interviewer, he played the interviewer, he interviewed Alec Innes, myself uh, and so on um, and he acted all the voices and it sounded exactly like all of us, not like Peter Sellers. How do we know we can trust her to do it right if she don't even know what she's doing? I tell you, I hate little old ladies. I want it settled here and now. No one is indispensable, Louis. Only the plan, my plan. Do you agree, Medron? <laughs> well, I, I'm with you, Professor. After all, it is 12,000 pounds all round. One round? I'm staying with Ma. I'm staying with Ma. I'm staying with Ma. What do you say, Louis? I want it settled here and now. 
At the end of the film, he came to me and said um, if I could help him to get another film part. And he obviously wasn't putting it on, he meant it. And I meant it when I said, you won't need my help. That launched a star The dearest things I know Are what you are Someday My happy arms Will hold you and someday I'll know that moment divine When all the things you are Are mine You are the promise kiss of Bring time Let me make The love Here Dad, how much longer are you going to be in that bathroom? Oh blimey, I can't get a shaving piece in this house Oh Lonely winter my, my memory of Peter is a house with cameras, lights and lots and lots of cable all over the place you know, and, 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 and drawers and cupboards full of cables and plugs and lamps and, and uh, camera, I don't know, everything. He also liked, um, he liked making models. He used to do that with Graham Stark. I think we had the entire American battle fleet built plastic bottles and he would ring up and he said revels have just bought out the u.s saratoga we haven't built that have we i said no we haven't Anne was very patient considering what we used to do but we did like building models He also liked trains, any toys that went round and, you know, that you could press a button. And again, gadgets, you see. He said it was for Michael, but actually I think it was for himself. We've gone into colour. Well, how do you do, sir? How very nice of you to call round. I, I hope you are interested in one of these super eyes zettas. They're absolutely tip top. I can assure you, absolute economy and petrol consumption. Would I to get in, sir? Please open the door. Just pull down, that's right. Open it up, and in you get. Try the driving position. I'm sure you'll find it absolutely first class. Absolutely. Now, just close the door, that's right. They're lovely little things, you know. Road holding is absolutely superb. Now, close the door, that's right, sir. Isn't it? You see, you get a lovely rear window. Plenty of view, you see. You can see all around. And, um... Uh, oh, I, I, actually, I wouldn't climb on the back, sir, if I were you, please, because it, um, it's not actually intended for that. Um, I should... Uh, I always remember him with a light meter, and I always remember his light meter dangling, because I was light meter height, and they were always there. Just a few moments. Jolly good luck. Thank you very much. Children, here is your music for today. I lived quite near to Peter in North London, and he would uh, quite frequently ask us back to his house at a weekend. He had intercom practically from one room to another, and he was into tape recorders, which we're going back now to sort of 50, mid-50s. 
he used to enjoy this business of, he'd get his ukulele out and he'd, he'd sing a song, like, you're the cream in my coffee, and he'd sing it with the ukulele or something, and play it back at the wrong speed, and we got all that chipmunk stuff, which was terribly childish, but it absolutely fascinated him, and he roared with laughter at all this. So I eventually got into a film called My I'm All Right Jack, made by John Bolting, and played a union shop steward. And, uh, and, and, and won the British Film Academy Award. Now, this is not in the film. No. But of course, he loved playing around, yes, didn't he? Yes. He, loved, he loved toys. Now, look at, look at that now. He would have worked really, wouldn't he, uh, as well, if he had been way in the, in the Hal Roach, Chaplin, silent films, the Buster Keaton stuff. Oh, yes. He'd have been as, as successful as he is now with his invention. I never really wanted to do much in the theatre. You see, I've been a great film fan all my life. Mm. I mean, I, I carry, I mean, I literally, whenever I go to America, I carry an autograph book around with me. And I never say it's not for me, it's for my sister, you know. I always say it's for me, would you sign that? Because I really do. You see some incredible people there. I mean, marvellous people. And I mean, it's ridiculous to ask for an autograph, except that, you know, you, you feel like you're compelled to, you know, yes. you want to. We were not asking him to play the role uh, of a goon. He came down to the studios and we started to dress him up in the clothes that we had assembled and the makeup and the hair, the haircut, moustache. And uh, as he started to put it on, it was interesting to see him sort of adjust, physically adjust. To playing, to playing Fred Kite, and he was feeling sort of bad. You could see him start to assume the rather pompous attitude. Yes, here's another good one to start on: collective childhood and factory manhood. Oh, sounds fun. Yeah, very descriptive. It's all about how they run factories in a worker's state. However, I won't spoil it for you. You ever been to Russia, Mr. Kite? Uh, no, not yet. It's the one place I'd like to go to, though. All them cornfields and bally in the evening. Oh. I wish I knew as much about it as you do. Uh, you ever read any of Lenin's works, have you? Um, no, I'm afraid I haven't. That'll open your eyes for you. Is he still on about Russia? I'll tell you straight. That's all we ever get to hear in this house. Have another cup of tea, Mr. Windrush. Uh, no, I won't. Thank no? you very much, no. He did several other movies bef before he came to John and Roy. So he'd got acquainted with the cameras and the film studios. But John and Roy uh, gave him uh, an extra dimension, an extra gear change, which I think uh, lifted him completely into a straight character actor. They gave him a fully rounded part. They gave him a very, very good part. They gave him a part uh, where he didn't have to um, completely use his comedic qualities. He wasn't, he didn't have to look for jokes, he didn't have to pull faces, he had to play this man real. Now, people have compared you, I suppose, inevitably with Alec Guinness, that in The Mouse That Roared, you played three characters, and in Kind Hearts and Coronets, Alec Guinness played uh, six or eight characters. Oh, yeah. But um, how do you feel about this? Well, of course, I'm very proud to be uh, compared with Guinness. Firstly, because I have great, great admiration for him as an actor, and secondly, because he's a very close, close friend of mine.
And I think that I'm very proud to know him and to have worked with him. And to be compared with him? Well, as Alec might say himself, one is very pleased to be compared with anybody, really. One never knows. I'm back to the impressions again. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, in fact, was christened Richard Henry. The first child was christened Peter and died before he was a year old. And so Peter, and he never knew quite why, was always called Peter, not Richard Henry. And in a sense, he took the place of the dead child and was, during his formative years, totally smothered in maternal affection. He had been used to this woman that would allow him anything. That however badly beh he behaved as a child, he was allowed just to get away with it. And I, I guess he thought, well, I mean, that, that, that was instinctive in him. He thought that all women would be like his mother. I've got a clock that wakes me every morning for my train. I've got a corn that gives me warning when it's going to rain I've had a dream that's coming true I've got a sweetie in view I'm as happy as I could be because I've fallen in love with the girl you see I haven't told her, hasn't told me, but we know it just the same Saturday night on her city, oh what a time there's going to be I haven't told her, she hasn't told me, but we know it just the same She still calls me mister, but she won't, I know she won't After I've kissed her, I've got an idea soon there'll be One little, two little, possibly three I haven't told her, she hasn't told me, but we know it just the same. You would, you would seem to be interested in pursuing as many different characters as you can possibly play. Though. That's right, that's right. What, what about a perfectly straight hero, a romantic part, as it were? No, not for me. I leave that to the, uh, the young hands of Brigade. No, I, I prefer playing uh, the non-romantics. Uh, I mean, it's no good trying to play Hello Darling parts. You know. It would come out rather funny, you think? Oh, yes, it'd be useless. I'm terribly self-conscious, and uh, it wouldn't work. I know that. That's what it Every character he played, he would bring home. He'd, he'd come home as uh, the Indian doctor, or the, I can't remember the name of the character, or some little Welsh man, or, you know, it's very strange and, and very unnerving. A bit like living on the edge of a precipice, you weren't quite sure. You weren't quite sure. You weren't quite sure whether he'd be absolutely wonderful when he came home, or he'd be absolutely ghastly. And you'd have some sort of terrible row. Peter had uh, the ability to identify completely um, with another person and think his way physically and mentally and emotionally into their skin. Where does that come from? I have no idea. Is it a curse? Often. Uh, I don't think there's a correlation which is direct though. I mean, I think it's not enough in this business to have talent. You have to have talent to handle the talent. And that, I think, Peter did not have. What time is it, Eccles? <laughs> uh, just a minute, I, I got it written down here on a piece of paper. <laughs> a nice man wrote the time down for me this morning. Ah, 
Then why do you carry it around with you, I guess? Well, um, if uh, anybody asks me the time, <laughs> I, I can show it to them. It's uh, due to radio that I ever got anywhere at all. And so it has a very, very soft spot in my heart, you see. And the, the Goon Show, apart from doing a lot for, I think, I can say this in all modesty, doing a lot for British humour. It's personally, it's done a lot for each of us individually. Apart from which we get a great, great kick out of doing it. It's a great pity it's finished now. But still, it's nine years. Wait a minute, there goes my good man. What is it, fellow? It's written on this bit of paper. What is eight o'clock is written? I know that, my good fellow. That's right. Um, when I asked a fellow to write it down, it was eight o'clock. Well, then, supposing when somebody asks you the time, it isn't eight o'clock. Well, then I don't show it to them. We lived in um, St. Fred's, which was a, a sort of nice suburban house. And then we saw this advert in the Sunday Times for this manor house in Chipperfield. So we went out to have a look at it. And Peter decided there and then he had to have it. When we moved into there, he'd done all the bolting films and the mouse that roared and that's where he did the millionaires I remember the garden parties I remember uh, Stanley Kubrick here they would have been doing Lolita I would think or planning Lolita That was where I took an instant dislike to Sophia Loren. I, I wasn't in, at all impressed because of the, 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 the um, ructions she was causing in the family. But he was living the life of a, shall we say, in inverted commas, a film star. I don't know, we had four gardeners and a nanny and a, a butler and a cook and uh, God knows what. The bad times really started when we moved into that house. dragged me out for a plane trip to go to Rome to see uh, who's her husband? Carlo Pontier. Then in the evening they took us to Mussolini's villa to have dinner. And at that time I was a very good looking boy and she took a shine to me and squeeze my hand. I'll just tell you this from my point of view, uh, but then, then she was with, with Peter and all this, but he wanted an excuse to go and see her. Uh, and he brought me along as a traveling companion. I think there was an invisible continuum between them. I had the chance, 
presented itself, I think he might have gone for a hook line or sinker. <laughs> of course I adored his sense of humor. Every woman did. Those sparkling flashes of wit that were so characteristic like the... <laughs> yes, like the time he spilled a cup of tea down his trousers and said... Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've gone and spilled tea all down my trousers. <laughs> I just think of Englishmen. He was cast opposite this stunningly beautiful woman, which she was. And he, he became besotted by her. I'm not sure if the feeling was returned, but I mean, he felt it was, and it was very genuine to him. He then treated me as his mother, which I should allow him to do whatever he wanted to do. And he would come to me with his problems about Sophia. It got very difficult. He never wanted to split up. He didn't want to divorce, he didn't want me to leave, he didn't want to, to make any waves in that way. He just wanted to be able to do what he liked, wherever he liked, and come back and tell Mama what was going on. And I was supposed to be um, sympathetic to him. Well, it didn't actually work. So eventually, I guess I left. I, I, I can remember them rowing before I can remember why. I just remember the noise of them rowing as opposed to, to, to what they were actually rowing about. And usually inconsequential, which it was with him. You know, you could say hello the wrong way and that would that that, that could uh, that could get you a tirade if you weren't if you, you know, if you weren't enthusiastic enough at the right time. the Sophie Loren thing was brewing and it was all going on and his career was getting larger and, and, and he was busy either promoting or, or doing that and off around the world. He as a person, you know, he, was, he already reached the point where he couldn't walk out the door without being recognised and uh, I think all that was overcoming him, overtaking him. And we were sort of disappearing slowly into the distance. I remember Sophia Lauren saying one day to me, what is happiness? So, you know, and I tried to think about what is happiness. And I suppose it's those brief moments that you can honestly, that, you, that come to you, that you can say, my God, I'm really happy today, or something's happened. I, and then it goes. And I suppose, really, if you had happiness all the time, you'd probably get blasé with it. I mean, you, you never appreciate it when it came along. I suppose one lives for the, the, the moments, you know. I mean, you know, I'm very grateful to have done well in this business. And um, having sort of got there, I achieved this sort of aim, and I'm very happy. But, of course, uh, the other side of one's life, uh, I, I have two, two lovely children, wonderful children and so then uh, when I'm with them it's marvelous everything's great uh, uh, periods when I'm on my own it's not so great I joined him in January 1961 and continued with him until June 77. I was a little concerned because I heard that uh, staff came and went like turning on the tap and running water, but uh, everything turned out fine. Yeah, I remember in Hampstead I hadn't been with him that long because he'd moved into there from Chipperfield and it was during that time that he was very depressed because his wife had left him. Uh, there were times when I genuinely thought, as naive as I was then really, that he would commit suicide. He really... So that is when I actually moved in to the... To, he was there on his own 
and uh, that's when I moved in and, and subsequently stayed. Mr. and Mrs. Forbes, Brian Forbes, used to come up quite a lot and, and hold his hand till he went to sleep. He liked people around him that he knew and he felt confident with, uh, faces that he knew. He didn't particularly like to mix with strangers, but those people that it, and it, he'd have a great time. And then all of a sudden, for no reason, he would maybe go into a depression again. A very complex uh, character altogether. They say that uh, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Uh, perhaps you could give us some idea. Uh, what sort of food does Mr. Sellers eat? Well, for the f five months I've been with him, um, he's been on a diet. He's been on a diet, yes. Any um, noticeable improvement? Oh, yes, a great improvement. Really? What's That's he come down from? Um, uh, that I'm not quite may sure. May I rephrase that? What's I think Peter on? was an incurable romantic. Um, it's perfectly true that he did develop a an obsession for my wife, but it was so typical of him that he didn't go behind my back. Um, he came and admitted it very freely, uh, in a most bizarre way. An address to William Shakespeare by William Topaz McGonagall, poet and tragedian. Immortal William Shakespeare, there is none you can excel. You have drawn out your characters remarkably well which is delightful for to see enacted upon the stage. That he was in love with Nanette and wished to marry her, to which I replied, well, you know, I can't fault your taste. Um, how does Nanette feel about that? And he said, rather engagingly, well, she doesn't know. I, have, I thought I would tell you first, which was typically Peter. I mean, in many cases, I think Peter was uh, slightly mad, shall we say while seated around the fireside on a cold winter's night. Thank you, folks. Did you enjoy that? Oh, very good indeed. I'm yes. very glad. Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> Jim and oh golly gosh, show oh gee, I'm falling in love and so is she. I haven't told her, she hasn't told me, but we know it just the same. Saturday night on her city, oh what a time there's going to be I haven't told her, she hasn't told me, but we know it just the same We don't do much spooning, but we will You wait until we're honeymooning Saturday night on her city, oh what a time there's going to be I haven't told her, she hasn't told me, but we know it just the same very much Peter was Jewish on, in, on the maternal side. His mother was Jewish and the um, family was Mendoza, the great bare-fisted boxer, Daniel Mendoza. Good evening, the Antique and Curio Shop. We have with us this evening Mrs. Agnes Sellers, the well-known antique dealer and um, candle maker. <laughs> And um, she's going to g give, her, uh, give us her, her opinions of uh, several pieces of antique Georgian silver which have been obtained for um, uh, Mr. Peter Sellers by Mr. David Mappin. Mrs. Sellers, could you give us uh, your um, uh, judgment on these uh, pair of um, very exquisite uh, candlesticks? Would you say they are early, would you say they are first, second or third George? I should say they were second. Uh, I should think about the 17th century. Hmm. Well, I tell you, uh, in fact, they are, they are f George the First. Peg was the prime influence in Peter's life, both positively and negatively. There they are, you in see? In perfect condition. In perfect condition. And it was a thin, divided line between love and hate, the relationship. What would you say that is? Oh, well, that's a Georgian, of course, isn't it? Exquisite piece. George II. And and in George and Silver. Yes, in perfect condition. She would say, I love you, Peter, and he would say, I love you, Peg. But I really love you, Peter. That's well, that one, uh, uh, now, this I should imagine. I don't know. Of course, I am not an expert. But I really love you, Mother. Oh, I thought you were an expert. No, no. And that would go on and on and build and build until it became a row. 
very... It was very odd to witness. Take that on a call back, would you? Oh, indeed. Yes. You see, most people that you go to yes. see have these sort of things left to them. Yes. And you don't, you can't have uh, all knowledge of things. You have well, a that little... was actually left to me by arrangement with money. Uh, this oh, yes. is a plain yes. tape coffee pot made yes. in London in 1737 by Francis Tate. Peter, when I meet a well-known actor for the first time, I always feel I know him a little because I've seen him and I feel I know a little about his character. But with you, you are a complete stranger. Do you do do you hide your identity behind the character you play on purpose? Well, I've got nothing about me as a person that I could say I could put on the screen and say, you know, uh, well, this is what I'm offering. This is my stock in trade, if you like. I mean, because that's all actors got anyway. I mean, I've got nothing I could say. Uh, well, let's build up on me as uh, as a as a person on the screen. Well, I mean, to see me as a person on the screen would be one of the dullest experiences you could ever <laughs> wish to experience. But as soon as I can get hold of something, I can get hold of a character or or a voice or some makeup or something. I can then use that as a shield, get within it, and hope to make the character live act as a medium, if you like and let the character come out through me. Well, I got the impression that Peter was a very, very superstitious man. I lived in Hampstead at the time, and almost opposite my house, uh, Maurice Woodruff lived. Now, Maurice was a clairvoyant and wrote a column in one of the Sunday evening papers, and he was a friend of Peter's. And I used to see Peter's car outside Maurice's house frequently. And I understood uh, at that sort of time that Peter rarely would make a major decision on his career without first going and consulting Morris. What seemed to be a complete failure can now be transformed into something profitable and worthwhile. You may still feel bruised and battered by events. But once you accept things as they are, you can create things as they might be. Willingness to forget and forgive is everything. You'd go, go and see Morris. And Morris used to phone me and said, Peter's coming to see me. He said, is there anything you want me to tell him? Like, if he says anything, should I tell him yes or no? <laughs> it's true. I mean, it's hysterical. I mean, Morris would say, what's he going to do? And I'd say, well, we've got a script. He's looking at me quite light. So he said, should he do it? I said, yeah, he should do it. It's nothing wrong. It's a good script. It's a good director. And he'd go and tell him. When they tortured you, did you talk? Ah, oh, no, I... Uh... Well, <laughs> I don't think they wanted me to talk, really. I don't think they... I wanted me to say anything. It was just their way of having a bit of fun, the swines. The strange thing is, they make such bloody good cameras. Now then, Dimitri, you know how we've always talked about the possibility of something going wrong with the bomb. The bomb, Dimitri. The hydrogen bomb. He was the only actor that I knew who could really improvise. Improvisation is something useful in rehearsal to explore a role. But most actors, when they improvise, stray into a sort of repetitive hodgepodge, which leads them down a dead end. While Sellers, by contrast, even when he wasn't on form, after a time, fell into the spirit of a character and just took off. It was miraculous. On many of these occasions, I think Peter reached what can only be described as a state of comic ecstasy. I filmed him with many cameras, never less than three. Also, when, when they go down into the mine, everyone would still be alive. There would be no shocking memories. And the prevailing motion will be one of nostalgia for those left behind. Combined with a spirit of bold curiosity for the adventure ahead. <laughs> When you did the character of Dr. Strangelove, you did that, of course, in a German accent. Well, Can I'll you tell you something about that. Right. Uh, 
uh, I was stuck, you see, because I didn't want to do just a, a sort of a, a normal sort of English broken German accent thing. Mm -hmm. So on the set was a little photographer from New York, a very cute little fellow called Ouija. You must have oh, probably yes. heard of him. Mm -hmm. And he had a little voice like this, used to walk around a set talking like this most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> he used to go and say, I'm looking for a girl with a beautiful body and a sick mind. He always used to say that. And I got an idea, I was really stuck with this, and I thought, you know, well, Ouija used to get all this stuff, everything, he used to have great big and larger lenses on the front of the camera, mm -hmm. and a cloth over his head, and he'd just get ready to do it, and Stanley would say, not now, Ouija, he'd say, okay, and move it all away, you see. <laughs> so I thought, if I put a German accent on top of that, you see, Vanya suddenly got this thing, you know, there, that's going up here and saying that, sir. and so I got into Dr. Strangelove, so really, it's Ouija, I don't know if he knows it, but uh, it's Ouija. Hello, Peter. Ouija, tell me something. I've been I'll always... tell you something. I think you're the world's greatest actor. And oh. I worked in Hollywood for about 12 years. Really? With all the great ones. Red Skelton, Gregory Peck, Sterling Hayden. Tell me something. Is Ouija your own name? No. Uh, Ouija, I was nicknamed. Actually, it should be spelled W-I... No, W-O... No, O-U-I-J-A. After oh, the Ouija board. Do you feel there's anything psychic about your acting? Well, I think there is to a certain extent, yes. I don't know about my acting in particular, but I think there is, as far as acting goes, certainly as far as people who really delve into characters, because I think that they, uh, when they're searching for the character, they leave themselves open, as does a medium. And I think that sometimes you can be inhabited by the spirit of perhaps someone who lived at some time or, or was a bit like the person you're doing and maybe they come in and use you as a chance to relive again. Well this all comes down to a sort of search for something. At the beginning of your success, I think it was about 1954, you did say that you were going to, you were working to buy an island and live in a state of idyllic happiness. Well of course... Will I... you ever buy an island? I don't believe there is such a thing, you see, as idyllic happiness. It seems to me that it's a very evasive thing. I think he stressed the fact that he was not loved, or he felt that he was not loved by people. He asked me to marry him, believe it or not, even though no physicality, nothing had passed between us. I think he was just desperate to marry. I said, Peter, I like you very much as a person, but I, I don't love you. He says, but that'll come. I always got the feeling of a very lonely man who would do practically anything to have somebody who's his. One morning he came and says, I'm going to meet somebody with the initials B.E. I said, oh, okay. Who says so? He says, Morris Woodruff. I said, all right. Uh, where? He says, he didn't know. Mr. Tennis, this has been a pretty whirlwind romance, hasn't it, to say the least. Can you tell us the story of how you met Miss Eklund? In brief, um, I was staying at the Dorchester while I was doing a film, and uh, one evening I looked in the paper and saw Brit's picture that she had just arrived in England. And I thought what I saw was very good. <laughs> and I thought that I would like to meet what I saw. And so um, a friend of mine said, how strange, she happens to be staying at this hotel. I said, where? So he said, just down the corridor. So down I go. I said, um, would you like to have a drink? Or words to that effect. And um, do you come here often? And things like that. And she said, yes, I'd love to have a drink. So in she came, and I took a lot of pictures of her. And um, before I knew it, when she went away, I missed her terribly. And uh, I thought, well, you know, this is it. A 
he was very suave. I remember dinners, Trader Vic's, those drinks with straws. I remember a little dog, he gave me a little dog. It's not a very practical gift, I suppose. I remember Elsted, the house that we were later to live in, he took me out there. I remember him taking me to meet Princess Margaret and Lord Snowden before we got married. The, the Pink Panther was playing, it was a huge success, and Dr. Strangelove was coming out as well. Mm. So he, he was successful, very, very successful. Peg was at the wedding, but it, it, uh, it, it never developed into any loving relationship between Peg and her new daughter-in-law. I think Anne, Peter's first wife, actually developed more of a relationship with Peg after they were divorced because of the grandchildren, Michael and Sarah. But Brit was never a favourite of Peg's. She was known as the bleeding Nazi. The bleeding Nazis married my darling boy. Or at um, Alla is so glad. Um... Tack. Uh, Now you explain. <laughs> well, Papa's going to speak anyway, so he can say that. Oh, yes. Please translate. Please well, I, I, I just said that I was very happy that there were so many here and that you all look um, very happy. <laughs> <laughs> Over and just a moment. Two. This is a bit nasty. Stan, we're. Um, no, darling, uh, this is being recorded, everything we're oh, saying now. I no. love you. You hear that, folks? I love you. She said she loved me. Yeah. In. Uh, on, on, on the pre-striped film, she loves me. She loves me, yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she loves, loves me, yeah, yeah, yeah. When yeah. does this twist start, love? And let's have some music on now, folks. Thank you. I'll put some music on. It's no good music for this. We married on a Wednesday, and he left on a Saturday, because he had to start working on the Monday in Hollywood.
Easter was coming up, his children were going out to spend time with him, and he said, can't you come? I said, well, I will ask the film company, and they said no. They wouldn't give me the time off. So he said, well, just take the time anyway. I, I will arrange it, I'll, I'll fix it. I knew in my heart, I have very, very good instincts, and I knew when I don't follow my instincts, things always go wrong. And I knew in my heart I was doing the wrong thing. I just knew it. But I wasn't my own woman in those days. So I went, and I mean, it was fabulous being together. At the time he met Brit and the relationship built, I was very, very happy for him. I'd never seen him so happy. He had something to do, he was occupied, and she genuinely, as far as I could see, loved him. So I thought, oh, this is great, you know, at least it made life a lot easier for everybody around him. He brought me to this marble palace in, just off Sunset Boulevard, outside Beverly Hills. He had a whole wardrobe filled with clothes. Everything from shoes, bathing suits, dressing gowns, night gowns, day clothes, evening gowns. I mean, it was everything that I, in my dream in Sweden, thought Hollywood should be. It was all a bit magical because obviously he was being courted by the companies, although he might have probably been contracted. They were laying this on, they were laying that on. Everything was like, you know, you, you, people were falling over themselves to make sure everything was okay. And then one morning, uh, I remember waking up one morning, there was all commotion, there was people all over the place, there was noise, there was people coming and going, and then some of these sort of white suited types come, you know, the, the, the nurses or whatever, the ambulance drivers come out with him on, on a gurney saying, um, and he gets up on his elbow and he said, look, I'm not feeling very well, I've got to go to hospital for a bit, so I'll be a few days and I'll see you soon. On the morning of April 6th, 1964, Peter Sellers was rushed to Cedars of Lebanon Hospital in downtown Los Angeles. Diagnosis, heart attack. If you have, in fact, 13 heart attacks, one in a row, and the supply of blood to the brain is stopped for a maximum period of two minutes, I think something must happen. Uh, they did tell me that I suffered no brain damage at all. But I'm pretty sure deep down, and this is something only I know, but I come across these periods of blankness, of loss of memory. But I do remember one thing clearly, a feeling. And the feeling was that I wouldn't expire, I wouldn't actually die. Because I remember there being a sort of large arm. I can only describe it, that if you think of a whole air of blackness, now imagine an arm, bare arm, but a very strong arm, and pulling you, for you to hold on to it, an outstretched arm, and you hold this arm, this arm says, in its own way, you can feel it saying, I won't let you go, I won't let you go. And I held on to this arm, and I knew as long as I had that arm, that I wouldn't, I wouldn't die. When he was getting better, Spike and I sent him a wire saying, "You swine, we had you heavily insured." <laughs> but that was that was uh, perhaps he realised um, his own mortality then and decided to make the most of life before it happened again. Could have been a reason for some of his behaviour after all. There's a song that I. My mother sang to me. Oh. She 
sang it as she taught me in when I was ninety-three. Who was that bum? He came back to Elstead, this lovely home in the country, and amongst the guests, uh, Prince Charles himself used to come down, came down to lunch, and they used to, because he was a great admirer of the goons, and Peter Sellers got together, Harry Seacombe and Spike Milligan, I think it was Michael Bentine, and they all came down and had this wonderful lunch where there was guffers of laughter coming from the, from the house, and Prince Charles used to actually do the voices. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm presenting this afternoon in our fresco for the very first time a few successful and highly dramatic quick changes. I can claim quite safely to be the only one in Europe performing these amazing feats before your very eyes, without extra paraphernalia whatsoever. No trickery, no, nothing at all. May I present, ladies and gentlemen, my impersonation in 11 seconds flat before your very eyes of Her Royal Highness Princess Margaret! <laughs> By the time we got back to England that summer, I was pregnant. And the first time I really felt that, that this is not normal was when Hugh Hefner called him and said, we have photographs of Brit in the nude that we're going to publish in the paper. But we feel that you're such a wonderful photographer, so why don't you take some photographs of her? And we published those instead. And I said, I said but Peter, I have never, ever in my whole life post for new photographs. But he wouldn't listen to me. He said, Hugh Hefner says you have, you have. And he wouldn't listen to me. There was nothing I could say or do. I knew that this, this is not normal. This is not how a, a normal man should behave towards his wife, particularly when she's pregnant. I think it's because he was jealous and because she was a young attractive girl which she was I think he was afraid that it was going to be taken from him somehow or other After the Fox was a script that he'd received, uh, written by Neil Simon, and it was going to be directed by Vittoria De Sica. Now, this great Italian director, he'd admired him since he was ever interested in films. As he read into it, he thought this was going to be a great masterpiece. He was so looking forward to going out. 
flew out to Italy, went on location to an island called Ischia, which was wonderful. Everything had been working so perfectly. He was suddenly going to do this film with this great Italian director mm. and, and have his wife on the film, which is something that he really wanted to do, and he was going to make a great big star out of her. And then mm. the whole thing disintegrated, mostly because he became so, well, disillusioned, disillusioned with the whole with it, affair, yeah. really. Didn't it wasn't he? going his way no. as he'd read into the script. It wasn't and going to wasn't be what he wanted it to be. And he wasn't performance at all. And so therefore that made home life very difficult. And one day he said to me, he said, the trouble is, he said, this man's a seeker, he said, he thinks in Italian. He said, I think in English. And he said, he's got the wrong perspective of it. It doesn't work. It does not work as it should work. I hate everything I do so much that uh, I always think, well, I've you know, got to go one better before I die, because, I mean, you know, I don't remember by all that lot. So I always think that there's something left in me. I mean, I know there is. I know there's something sort of in here somewhere that I want to get out. Uh, I think probably do it to people like Blake, who really understand me, or Stanley Kubrick, who also understands me, who knows, seems, to what, seems to know what goes on in here. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's just when you get with people who say, uh, who can't communicate. Um, and then you think, next time round, I'm going to do it, you know. Next time round, I really do it. So I went along to the Dorchester and I saw him, where he told me he was going to make Casino Royale. And uh, he would like, you know, like if I was interested in, in reading whatever script existed and uh, saying whether or not would I direct it. And of course I said, yeah, I'll direct whatever's happening, Peter, and uh, the rest is history. Imagine my surprise when we get onto the set and Peter uh, takes me aside and says, I don't want to appear in the same setup as Orson. I don't want to be in the same setup. I don't want to be seen in the same frame as, as Orson. And I said, well, I mean, that's stupid. I mean, apart from anything else, the, the, the whole value of, of, of having you and Orson together is having you and Orson together. And that's when we had this, we had a fight. He went for me. Absolutely said I had just sort of deserted him and, and left him alone and was no longer, you know. And he, he swung a punch at me, you know. So I, I thought, well, I either swing a punch back or else I'll never live this day. So I swung a punch at him as well. A stuntman came in and separated us and holding us both apart said, I don't know which one of you to hit. I love you both. <laughs> so Peter started laughing, made up friends and he said, look, I'm, I'm, I'm going off. I just have to make a phone call. So he went off the stage and disappeared for three weeks. And I was left with Orson who every morning said to me, Where's our thin friend, Joe? I'm a very ambitious person. I don't believe by any means that I've even begun to do what's inside me. I have a burning sort of fire inside me to do certain things which I know I'm going to do. And I'm going to defeat all these Burks that are around me and I'm going to do it. Are you going to find the kind of fulfillment you're looking for, though, in, in your work or in a relationship with a woman, do you think? I don't think I ever find it in a relationship with a woman. I think he found it very difficult to have a decent relationship. I suppose it probably boils down to his mother um, being an only child, um, becoming rich and famous and never having to, you know, nobody ever saying no to you. It was um, a constant quest really and I think the women were just part of that.
I remember when my mother died, although I have children alive, she was the last close relative. I felt a great feeling of loneliness. I just couldn't pick up the phone and speak to my mother anymore. I felt that a lot. I felt that a lot. Peter, in a funny sort of way, I think if anything awful happened to him, like his mother's death or his father's death, or was was very nostalgic. I mean, he used to do, love doing these tours of of all the things that happened to him in his life, and he would say, "That's where I went to school, and I met my first love." And he was then seven years of age. You know, he'd tell me all about that, sitting outside the school. And, and in fact, when his mother died. I had a little shop and he came around there and he said, please, will you come around? He said, I just want you to come out in the car and go. And, and I had to do a tour of all the old places. And looking back now, do you believe that you really loved him, or were you just indeed dazzled? Oh, no, I really loved him. And you stayed five years and tried to prove it. I did, and I did my best. I have been disappointed so many times in people that I've become not uh, most certainly not bitter, but uh, I tend to approach people very warily in case they're going to clobber me. I find I get clobbered a lot. He was, you know, trying to hone in on who am I, who am I, what is it, what is it all about? Uh, Peter Bloy actually became a hippie um, around the late 60s and early 70s. And uh, uh, although I'd met him a number of times before, I got to re-know him through Ravi Shankar because he, he liked Ravi a lot and became close friends with Ravi Shankar. And, and at that time, you know, I was with Ravi all the time, learning sitar, and uh, we hung out together, the three of us, which was quite an unusual combination. You know, he knew that there was something else in, in life. The sad thing about Peter was I don't think he fully discovered the self. He was on the, the road to that. You know, he was doing a lot of yoga and meditating and was chanting Hare Krishna. My religion is yoga. I'm a yogi, therefore a person who does yoga. Consequently, I became highly sensitive, highly tuned, and the clairvoyancy that I knew I had within me then started to blossom. Not only did I become aware of feelings, people, plants, uh, ambiances, dogs, cats, animals, when I say I became aware of them, I became aware of their personalities and also unseen people who are not really unseen, they're only unseen if you're not sensitive. But I'm always aware of my mother's presence and, so, and other, many other people. <laughs> As any man would be that is, you know, no longer married, he, he went out with a lot of different women and traveled here and there and decides to rent a house in this country and for a few months and then, no, now we're going somewhere else to rent a house here and then we're going to stay in that hotel and it was very mixed up and jumbled but I would say very interesting. All out, like, we're going all out, you know. I 
I feel extremely vulnerable and um, I need help a lot, a lot. I suppose I, I, I feel mainly that uh, I need the help of a woman. So I'm just continually searching for this woman. This woman, you know, this guy. I keep reading of these great women behind men who support them and push them forward and, and you know, can they mother you. They're great in bed. They're like a sister. They're not there when you don't want to see them. They are there when you want to see them. I don't, I don't know where they are. Maybe they're around somewhere. I'll find one one of these days. I was best man at that wedding and the bridesmaids were the dogs. And then they went off on their honeymoon. I accompanied them and we were in the south of France and we were on this yacht and this was honeymoon time. And then one morning we couldn't find him. And then the ship to shore phone rang and it was him. He'd booked himself into a hotel and he'd left his bride of weeks on the yacht with me and we couldn't work out why. And he was just, I think, he regretted it almost immediately. He regretted it. It just, it wasn't, it wasn't working. It wasn't him, you know. He used to bring me all his new acquisitions in the way of girlfriends so that mum could see them and tell him what I thought of them. When you get married, you'll be the fourth, Mrs. Sellers. Does this frighten you at all? Oh, no. Four is my lucky number, my dear. <laughs> it absolutely... You're you obviously know, not is. disillusioned with the state won, of matrimony. The only time I won anything on roulette was when I bet on four. What, well, that's it, then? No, um, what was it you said? I'm sorry. No, 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 it's all right. No, that's <laughs> you know, I was saying after, after three marriages, yes. you're obviously still not disillusioned with the state of matrimony. I think that the state of matrimony is an excellent state to be in. And uh, I think you all be on that way. He was a very complicated man, he believed. And uh, soothsayers and fortune tellers. He, you know, he talked to God. Calls me up in the middle of the night and says, "Don't worry about how we're going to do that scene tomorrow. I just talked to God and He told me how to do it." Uh, he spoke with his his mother all his dead mother all the time and carried a kind of shrine around with him. Um, that's fairly complicated. I don't practice clairvoyancy. I mean, I don't give readings to people or, or um, do anything at parties or anything like that. It's, it's a very private thing, and I, uh, I accept the fact that I'm clairvoyant, and um, I have this other sight which is growing all the time. I suppose uh, eventually I will be able to make ectoplasmic contact with the spirit world, which is a fourth dimension anyway, and that's all it is. I think that he was very facile and, and uh, terribly talented, so it was not difficult necessarily for him to find a character or to come up with a, a funny notion and things like that. That was all part of him. But difficult to live on this planet, yeah. I think it was very difficult. I was introduced to her and we were told that she would like to take me and Michael out for a meal and get to know us and she seemed you know she seemed quite nice to begin with and I thought I actually told dad I thought she was a bit stupid <laughs> and I think that probably the answer was I was a bit stupid but she she came across as very bubbly and friendly and warm and um, interested but once they got married things definitely changed She 
didn't want to live with him. She wanted to be married, and so they married. That was the beginning. And then I think later on, as he he was ill, he was he wasn't old, but he seemed old. And she nursed him and looked after him, had taken over very much the running of his life. And I think a lot of it was fear, was the fear of having to deal with things himself again and, and being alone again. And he had alienated so many people by this point that it was very much, I think he saw it very much as Lynn was the one thing in his life, the one person in his life who was there. Whatever I have, and it may be nothing, whatever I have, I'm going to put up there and do it. I have great, great, great ambitions to do something which I will leave behind me because I know I have it in me. I know I have it in me. After their marriage in 1977, Sellers suffered a series of minor heart attacks, and as far as we know, he ceased his personal chronicle on film. He showed no intention of withdrawing from the cinema or his own celebrity and a string of Pink Panther sequels kept his name at the top of the world's box office lists. But on the 22nd of July 1980, having flown into Britain for a reunion dinner with fellow goons Spike Milligan and Harry Seacombe, he had a major heart attack. He died two days later, back in London, his hometown. More family movies coming up, helping to give a personal portrait of Spike Milligan, the multifaceted character of another comedy legend. Next. Why would he say a thing like that?